Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. I am completely innocent. Completely. Do you regret your treatment of Leo Moreno and Chris De La Serta? They are named in the indictments. The yellow journalism that has been trained out here against me is against, with this individual standing right here today. He has alleged lots of allegations against me. Even after your me. indictment, you're still going to throw yes, that out there? Yes, I am. Wow. Yes. Okay. And so if anybody should be apologizing to the community, it's Mr. Dylan Collar, it is you. Former Precinct 2 Constable Michelle Barrientes Vela telling our Dylan Collier he's the one who owes the apology. This after she and one of her top administrators were indicted on several felony charges today. It is the big story of the day today. Barrientes Vela and her captain Mark Garcia both charged with perjury and official oppression. The candidate for sheriff and her top assistant walking in shackles after turning themselves in this afternoon. Barrientes Vela facing additional counts of tampering with the government record after authorities say she created fake receipts for providing security at Rodriguez Park in an effort to thwart their investigation. Despite her legal troubles, Barrientes Vela says she will stay in the race for Bear County Sheriff. The case at 12 defenders have followed these accusations against the former constable for months. You can find a timeline of what led up to today's arrest on our website, ksat.com. A 14-year-old boy is recovering from severe stab wounds after a fight between several students yesterday. The boy's mother says that fight happened after school at a playground in shirts. Devin Clark shows us the video from that fight and tells us how the boy's mom is now reacting. I honestly, you know, don't know what, what caused the whole issue. Nora Owens says this video taken by an onlooker shows her two sons and nephew in an all out brawl with fellow Samuel Clemens High School students. This happening at the playscape right across the street in shirts. Unfortunately, there's no patrols to patrol that area as there should be. Owens admits her 14 year old son is the person seen here in black shorts and a black top body slamming someone to the ground. But during the fight, she says the other kid used a knife. She got stabbed once in the shoulder, left shoulder, left knee and right lower abdomen. The injuries, she says, could have cost him his life. He got stitches. He had emergency surgery. They had to uh, go in and uh, sew his small intestine, uh, I guess, back together. The school sent out an advisory to parents, but wouldn't comment on the altercation specifically. Owen says the students involved were all suspended, but this isn't the first time, and she fears it won't be the last that the groups have beefed. These kids, you know, are taunting every day, every day. Owen says she is hopeful the problems will calm down, especially since police say the boy who stabbed her son was arrested and charged. While Owen says her son's surgery was successful, she has no idea how long he's going to have to stay in the hospital. Right now, he's on an ice diet. They also have to make sure that he doesn't get any subsequent infections. The investigation into this whole ordeal continues. Reporting outside of University Hospital, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. A new at six and now former teacher has gone from the classroom to a jail cell. 44 year old Jose Eduardo Hernandez is in the Bear County Jail tonight under bonds totaling $80,000. He's accused of sexual assault of a child as well as having an improper relationship with one of his students while he was teaching at Lanier High School. San Antonio Police and Medina County Sheriff's deputies yesterday arrested Hernandez at a middle school in Hondo, where he's now no longer employed. Jesse DeGriado reports his arrest comes 10 days after the alleged victim spoke to SAPD's Special Victims Unit. Before leaving there last May, Jose Eduardo Hernandez, 44, had been a two-year employee with the San Antonio Independent School District here at Lanier High School, where he taught social studies and coached girls softball and basketball. The alleged victim, 16 years old at the time, tells police in the arrest warrant affidavit her teacher and coach would have her skip class and drive her to a nearby motel room. There, she says, Hernandez would take photographs and videos of their sexual acts on his cell phone. The victim provided police her cell phone with images that he'd allegedly sent her via a social media website. She alleges their sexual relationship went on from January to September of 2019. This news is disturbing, says SAISD spokesperson Leslie Price, adding no concerns of an improper teacher-student relationship were ever brought to the school district. She says the Texas Education Agency is being made aware of the allegations against Hernandez. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News.
Tonight, a letter has been sent to Lanier parents about the arrest to assure them that the safety and well-being of their students is their number one priority. After his stint at SAISD, Hernandez was hired by the Hondo Independent School District. In a letter, the superintendent states, quote, none of the accusations against Mr. Hernandez pertain to Hondo ISD, end quote. It goes on to say he underwent a criminal background check and his references were checked out as well. But, quote, there was no indication of any incident or concern that would disqualify him from employment, end quote. However, as we said, he's no longer an employee of Hondo ISD. We have both statements and the letter on our website, ksat.com. Police are still searching for two people involved in a shooting last night where a man was killed while driving. We first shared the story as breaking news last night on the night beat. That shooting happened on Renova Street near Via Coronado Park on the south side. Police say the 27 year old victim was driving a truck with two suspects inside it. Witnesses say they heard multiple gunshots and saw those suspects check the driver's side of the truck and then take off. This is the 11th deadly shooting in San Antonio so far this year. An active scene at the courthouse downtown early this morning. Deputies say a man broke in and got stuck inside. The incident happened just before 12.30 a.m. 40-year-old Michael Bass, you see him here, allegedly smashed the front door to get in the courthouse, then damaged a door to a judge's chambers, but was eventually seen by housekeeping. Deputies say Bass made it all the way to the second floor of the building and tried to exit through a window, but was stopped by chicken wire and police. At this time, it's unclear what charges he will face. He cared. Those two words were repeatedly woven through the funeral service of District Judge Ray Olivati today. He lost his battle with cancer last week, but today was remembered as a dominant figure in the Bear County justice system for over three decades. Paul Venema there as Olivati's family, friends, and judicial colleagues paid their final respects. A procession of judges, all wearing their judicial robes in his honor, paid final respects to District Judge Ray Olivari. The veteran jurist was midway through his term as 144th District Court Judge when he died. During his public service life, he served in many capacities, from probation officer to judge. He was always there for others, willing to be there. And his goal was how to truly help this person to do justice. A judge remembered as a man who loved his family and truly cared for those with whom he dealt from the bench. Compassionate, but tough. He was tough when he needed to be. And, and if, if giving somebody a second chance came across as being not tough, well, he, he dealt with that. The funeral ended with Administrative District Judge Ron Rangel presenting the family with a state seal, noting that an element in the seal reflected Judge Oliver Ree. There's an olive branch that represents peace. What more peace can you get than to come across an individual that's got compassion, love in his heart, and wants to make the world a better place? In addition to attending his funeral, the judges paid one final tribute to Judge Olivari. In his honor, all courtrooms in the courthouse went dark. Paul Venom, a case at 12 News. Time saver traffic now. Let's take a look at the TransGuide camera here at Loop 410 and McCullough. That's where the camera is located, but this looks like it is headed toward 410 on to 281. There's a stalled vehicle that's being reported. There's flares set up there. You can see some flashing lights from patrol vehicles letting people know that this is an issue on this interchange. Certainly possible that it's backing up traffic in a heavily congested area here near 410 and 281. It just days after news broke of a communication company's link to a federal bribery investigation, the chiefs of every Bear County Emergency Services District urging the commissioner's court to keep away from the company's fire radios. But one of the chiefs tells Garrett Berger their request is not about, excuse me, is all about safety, not about scandal. In a letter dated Tuesday, all 11 emergency services districts are trying to get the county commissioner's court on the horn and ask them to change plans for new fire radios. The issue between the, the ruggedness of the radio has been something of contention from the moment that the contract was awarded. The San Antonio-based company, Daily and Wells Communications, has a $108 million deal with the city, county, and CPS Energy to create a public safety radio system. 
It's also been linked to a bribery investigation involving San Angelo's former police chief, who was charged last week. But despite the timing of the letter, one of the chiefs said they've been working on it for months, and it's separate from the scandal. It's a matter of it's time to make that decision, and we want to make sure that the judge and the county commissioners have our input on what we think that decision should be. The decision is which portable fire radios to use with the new system. Daleen Wells sells Harris brand radios, but the ESD chiefs think their firefighters should carry something else into burning buildings. And we're saying we would prefer the county purchase those Motorola's for the fire departments in the county. The ruggedness of those radios is just undeniable. The city, which is paying for most of this deal, says the ESDs can use different fire radios than the Harris ones. They just have to work on the new P25 system. To the ESD chiefs, it's a clear-cut decision. It's about the safety of our firefighters and of our citizens uh, just making the right choice. Well, the county spokeswoman provided this statement in regard to the letter that, quote, we are in receipt of the letter and have forwarded it to the appropriate county personnel for review. Live in the newsroom, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thanks, Garrett. UTSA is trying to spread the word to students about the upcoming 2020 census. The census happens every 10 years to collect data on people nationwide. It helps decide the amount of state representation and population. For UTSA, the census will impact federal funding like the Pell Grant. Organizers say it's important to host these events because a lot of students are unsure about how to fill out the paperwork. Many times students think, oh, my parents are going to count me back home, especially if they don't live in San Antonio permanently. But the census wants to make sure that you're counted where you live and where you rest your head the majority of the year. UTSA will also host an event on Census Day, which is April 1st, to help students fill out the form both in person and online. All right, going from gloomy to bright. Two days of gloomy to groovy. Groovy. Oh, you like that? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Maybe. The groovy Thursday. <laughs> Adam. Yeah. It is. It's beautiful outside. So we had some good rainfall yesterday. It was a good soaking rain. The aquifer is up. It's up a half a foot today. And now we're almost four feet above the January average. That was some good rainfall. It did wash the mountain cedar out of the air. But of course, here's the side effect of rain. Mold is very high today with a count of nearly 16,000. Pleasant though, very comfortable. Right now, 67 Port SA, along with Pleasanton, Divine 67, Comfort 63, along with Bulverde. Very seasonable tonight. We'll talk about the weather for the Cowboy Breakfast tomorrow and our next chance of rain, which comes this weekend. All that coming up. Thanks, Adam. Still to come, it is not every day a high school senior gets not only a full scholarship, but one to a prestigious school. It happened for one local teen, her path to success next. Also coming up, helping a child with autism, not a one size fits all type of thing. Why one family is switching to a more individualized approach for their child. I got a phone call. I got a phone call that my cousin has been shot in the head. A 15 year old shot and killed his 17 year old friend now in the Bear County Jail. Tonight on the Night Beat, the questions surrounding his death and how his family is using the painful loss to help other families on the night. Beat. One in 59 kids in the U.S. has autism, and boys are four times more likely to be diagnosed than girls. There is no one standard treatment with medication, occupational therapy, and nutritional therapies among all the options. Ursula Perry reports these days some families are turning to an individualized approach known as applied behavioral analysis. How many do you want? Six, please. David Galaxy and his wife have a busy household. Sarah's the oldest, and the twins are Evan and William. The twin boys was a, a, a big deal because it was like, you know, how are we going to handle twins? As they grew, the twins began to do things out of the ordinary, hoarding their toys and throwing food. So David and his wife took them for an evaluation. And immediately when we went there, it was, it was like black and white to them. It was... Yep, your kids are both on the spectrum. Your emotions are everywhere. Um, it's hard, it was very tough. But the Galaxies were committed to finding help for the family. David found a therapist who practiced Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA. It's a structured intervention that helps kids learn new behaviors and skills by repetition. I think ABA provides a good step-by-step -step 
um, approach to teaching all of those skills that you might find overwhelming at first. David says ABA helped with negative behaviors. 45 minute tantrums became two minutes long. It showed outside of the home as well. Going to the grocery store, if I said, William, stop, or Evan, stop, they stopped. Uh, whereas before, they would never have done that. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven, good. ABA therapy also helped the twins with skills they need for academic success, structure that helps them put all the pieces together. The amount of therapy needed might vary from child to child, but there are accounts that children who get more than 20 hours a week of ABA therapy actually do better. Keep in mind, insurance coverage will vary, not from state to state, but from company to company. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, Adam says it's groovy outside. <laughs> I would go with gorgeous. It's a beautiful day. It just kind of went from gloomy to, you know, yeah. went with that, but. Yeah, yeah obviously. It's with the rhyme. Right. Kind of a rhyme. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> it's very green, that's what's nice. The grass is greened up nicely. And, you know, along the roadways, when it was so brown for a while. And yeah. Now it's back, it's nice, it's good to see. That's groovy. There you go, <laughs> see, in more ways than one. <laughs> Right. I like this. I like where we're going here. All right. So temperatures will be very seasonable as we go through the night. Close to average as we get into tomorrow. Don't get too used to this sunshine, though, because more rain is just around the corner. Doesn't look like a good soaking rain, but at least a few showers. So as we go through the night and into tomorrow, temperatures will be near average. So that sets the stage for a cool cowboy breakfast. You'll definitely want the jacket if you're venturing out tomorrow morning. Sunny and comfortable, though. For the rest of the day, we'll quickly see the temperatures rise and it'll be a nice afternoon. Then the rain chance comes into play this upcoming weekend. 73 was our high today after a morning low of 48 degrees. Notice the average high is 63 and I think we'll be just a little above that tomorrow. The north wind kicked in and that north wind really dried out the air and you noticed a bit of the breeze earlier today. It's not all that strong right now, but it's enough to have really dropped our dew points quite a bit. So right now, not as much moisture in the air. You may notice a little extra dryness in your skin or some chapped lips just because the dew points are down now, right around 40 degrees for the most part. So we've got the dry air in place. Temperature wise, comfortable, crisp air. It's great. 64 in Pleasanton. Uvalde's at 68. Gonzalez at 59 already. Carrizo Springs hanging on to 72. Still some lower 70s south of town and temperatures just slowly drop off as you head northward into the 40s in the panhandle. So no huge temperature drop and we're not looking at any Arctic air really plunging southward anytime soon. So you're not going to see a big temperature difference really for the foreseeable future. There is a wound up system in the midsection of the country and it is dropping some snow where you see the blue on the screen up north. This is a wound up potent system. It's what brought us our good soaking rainfall yesterday. We were just on the tail end of it. And you see where the bulk of the moisture is along and east of the Mississippi right now, moving into parts of the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley. We're on the backside of it, so we're looking at another sunny day tomorrow. Here's our future cast through our Friday. Sunny, comfortable, pleasant conditions. Then we look westward and this little dip in the upper level flow is going to develop over basically the Baja Peninsula. It's going to have some energy with it, a little bit of Pacific moisture. That's our disturbance for Saturday. So that's really our next chance of rain. Notice as we get into Saturday mid late morning, the clouds are moving back into place. A fairly gray day on Saturday and then by the evening hours, probably some widely separated light showers developing. I don't anticipate a washout or anything to really sit and have a steady rain over one area. Just some brief passing little nuisance light showers, not adding up to all that much. So here's the breakdown for you this evening. Temperatures falling down to the 50s, 10 p.m. 52, midnight 49. Not much of a breeze and a clear sky. Then tomorrow we'll start the day at 40, but make it all the way into the upper 60s to near 70 with that sunshine. Then, as I mentioned, that chance of rain late Saturday, even into Saturday night, but clearing out nicely on Sunday. A beautiful way to finish off the weekend. All right, we'll take it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adam. For some Spurs fans, last night kind of epitomizes the frustration with LaMarcus Aldridge. You see yeah. him play great, and you're like, 
Why not every night? It, and you have to take into effect the, the age he is yeah. now, the, yeah. how many nights he has to play in a row, that sort of thing. But last night, he looked like LaMarcus of old and at the same time spoiled the debut of the NBA's top draft pick. And the Longhorns have a football date with the Bobcats again coming up. Williamson made his NBA debut last night for the Pelicans, but it was the Spurs' LaMarcus Aldridge who stole the show in New Orleans. That's after Williamson was held scoreless in the first quarter, didn't score his first NBA basket until the second quarter after missing the first half of the NBA regular season with a knee injury. All the while, LaMarcus Aldridge schooled the rookie. He would score 16 points in the first half, including seven straight in the last two minutes to give the Spurs a nine-point lead. But to the NBA's first pick's credit, he would find his rhythm in the fourth quarter. That's where the former Duke Blue Devil took off, scoring 17 of his 22 points in just three minutes, including four three-pointers to bring the Pelicans back from a 12-point deficit to take the lead. Marco Bellinelli would get that lead back late in the fourth quarter, and after that, LaMarcus with a key putback and then free throws down the stretch to score another 16 second-half points. They finished with 32 and 14 rebounds in the Spurs, 121-117 to victory. They're third in a row to get back into the Western Conference playoff picture. We just continue to get better and better each game. Um, it's a long season, so we got a lot of time to make up for how we started. But um, each time we're out here is a chance to get better, a chance to improve on what we need to work on. And um, I think we're trending in the right direction. All right, Williamson's 22 points is a franchise record for a Pelicans rookie debut, beating out Anthony Davis' 21. But how frustrating for him to be benched in crunch time in his NBA debut. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, you know, I'm 19. Honestly, in that moment, I'm not thinking about longevity. I'm thinking about winning that game. So it's very, it was very tough. We have to look long term and not, you know, one game short term, put him out there and play him extended minutes, you know. So uh, we were not going to do that in any situation. All right, next up for the Spurs, a rematch with the Suns tomorrow at 7.30. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Lawford. Cowboys new head coach Mike McCarthy is not attending the Senior Bowl while he continues to put together his new staff in Dallas and said Cowboys Vice President Stephen Jones is. That's where he told us that the, he likes about McCarthy become just the ninth coach in team history after he was fired by the Green Bay Packers after leading the pack to a Super Bowl win back in 2010 when it was in Jerry's world. Get this, since the Cowboys are keeping Kellen Moore as their offensive coordinator, McCarthy will use continue to use Moore's offensive terminology. I think it's a, you know, a big deal for our players to not have to start over with the language. I still think we're going to get a big benefit from Mike and his offensive mind in terms of, you know, putting concepts to his language. So uh, I just uh, think it's a big deal. Uh, he thought it was a big deal for, you know, our players not to have to relearn the language, and I think that's a huge plus. All right, Jones also expects linebacker Leighton Vander Esch to be ready for the offseason workouts after having surgery repair his neck injury. Texas Longhorns are facing Texas State Bobcats in football for the very first time since 1930. That was announced by both schools today as Longhorns finish out their future non-conference schedule for 2026. That season, Longhorns will actually kick off their season by hosting Texas State on September the 5th, which also includes a home game against UTSA on September the 19th. The Horns and Bobcats have only played once before. That was back in 1930 when the school was named Southwest Texas State Teachers College. Texas won that game 36 to nothing. The Highlands Owls have a new head football coach. He's Chris Castillo, who is a former assistant coach at John Jay High School. He replaces Hank Willis, who resigned after three seasons, going 7-4 and four his first year, making the playoffs. But over the last two seasons, they were just 4-26. Today, Castillo was introduced at Highlands High School this morning, and this was his message to his team. I want them to be uh, uh, the staple of the community. I want them to work hard, represent the H uh, anywhere they go. I want them to make sure that they're uh, working hard in the classroom, on the field, in the weight room. Uh, I just want to make sure that they understand the importance of their, of their role here at the school. Western Conference All-Star starting lineup just announced. No spurs on that. We wait to see if they make it as a reserve. All right. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. We'll be right back. A Houston high school coach is now facing felony charges after being accused of bringing a handgun to school and making a threat against the principal. In court, prosecutors said the coach was mad at the principal for not helping him get another job and the head coach for not giving him a promotion. That allegedly led him to making a comment about having a gun in a classroom and possibly buying more. 
Students believe the coach meant no harm, but some parents disagree. And he was overall just sort of amazing, great guy. He just made a dumb mistake, but he definitely did not have any negative attentions towards the whole incident. Maybe he wasn't going to do anything, but he thought about it enough to put it in his vehicle and bring it into the school. But my thinking is that there's something further than this. A judge revoked his concealed carry license, ordered him to stay 1,000 feet away from the school, and requested an ankle monitor. A rocket test in Texas ends in a fire and evacuations that happened at the Firefly Aerospace Test Facility, which is about an hour north of Austin. The company says a, quote, anomaly caused the fire. Their fire suppression systems quickly put the fire out. Deputies evacuated people within a mile radius and temporarily shut down local roads out of an abundance of caution, they say. Police have identified two suspects in a Seattle shooting that killed a woman and left a nine-year-old boy in serious condition. The suspects are 24 years old and considered armed and dangerous. Both have a lengthy criminal history. The shooting happened in downtown Seattle last night. Six other people were injured. A Queen Elizabeth canceling a public engagement at the last minute today. A royal source confirmed the cancellation was due to a slight cold. Queen Elizabeth forced to cancel her annual visit to the Sandringham Women's Institute. Queen Elizabeth has been a dutiful member of that institute, visiting nearly every year since she joined in 1943. From San Antonio Southside to Cambridge, Massachusetts, a local high school senior has earned a full scholarship to one of the world's most prestigious universities, MIT. Maria Garcia Garcia is part of the Young Women's Leadership Academy with one mission in mind, to succeed. Alicia Barrera sat down with Maria to see how she is well on her way. I didn't start robotics till last year. Maria Garcia Garcia, a distinguished high school senior with a love for technology and science, soon to be a first generation college student at MIT. I never imagined this at all. She's been accepted to MIT for their two degree program, electrical engineering and computer science. In like seventh grade, I got exposed to coding by a program called the Geek Bus, came to our school and they told us about how coding was a way that people made video games. Oh. And when I got to physics, I learned about like the electronics and like how electrical circuits work. But it wasn't until last year that Maria began to think she might have a chance to be accepted into a selective university. I found out that junior year they had a program for low-income students where juniors could apply and they it was basically an access to opportunities if you got in. We had a camera set up in the front. And Maria is part of the QuestBridge National College Match Program. It's a scholarship and college application process for low-income seniors interested in the nation's top universities. It's a rigorous process. You have to write two long essays and then multiple short answers and in addition to your application, which includes like financial information, background information. About 15,000 applied to the program. Almost 6,000 were selected as finalists, but only about 1,100 were selected as this year's scholarship recipients. A big accomplishment that doesn't surprise Maria's mentors at Young Women's Leadership Academy who have kept up with her test scores and activities. She's on the sports team and manages all of these difficult courses and clubs, and so they can see all of her potential and what she's going to be able to bring to the table at that demanding institution as well. Maria's advice to other students like her? Take advantage of the opportunities out there. You feel like you're the only one, that you don't have enough opportunities, or that you might not get something because of your situation, but you just gotta keep trying hard it. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Congratulations, Maria. Absolutely. That is awesome. Still to come, if you're on social media, you've definitely seen people talking about this, the passing of Mr. Peanut. How he died, apparently, and what the company is planning to do to honor him. Has a lot of people shell-shocked. And this giant pizza is not only for eating, but also for a good cause. Find out who benefits from the slices sold. Coming up. Welcome to the set of KSAT's News at 9, where we talk about what's coming up online at 9 tonight. And we're going to start off with the topic of one of San Antonio's great neighborhoods. It was undiscovered for a long time, but La Vaca is now being discovered by a lot of people. And that means some changes that 
longtime residents aren't that crazy about. Yeah, our Tiffany Huertas goes out to this neighborhood south of downtown to talk to some people who live there about their concerns over a proposed project that would transform old warehouses into commercial buildings and apartments. That's really a trend we've seen in a lot of different places yeah. around town. Those residents who live there, they say they have some concerns about the amount of apartments, how this development would be put into place. So they're hoping they can find some middle ground with that developer. She explains all of that tonight at nine. Yeah, so much development at Hemisphere Park. It's and bleeding it's into spreading. the Lavaca mm -hmm. neighborhood. Yeah, now we're also going to talk about Throwback Thursday. I can't get enough giant boot stories. <laughs> well, do we have something for you okay, tonight good. at nine? Yes. So the giant boots at North Star Mall, they celebrated their 40th anniversary a while back. Yep. We're taking a look at how they got here in the first place. Why is this something that everyone in San Antonio and really beyond knows about? So we're going to share their story in our Throwback Thursday. Yeah, I hope liking boot stories doesn't make me a heel. And then we're going to talk about trending as well. Myra gets the lowdown on everything <laughs> that's happening online. That's something we do every night here at 9. We talk about the trending stories on KSAT.com. They're usually quirky, a little bit off the wall. We got some good ones headed your way tonight at 9. All right, let's go back to the studio now with Adam. Going to talk about you know, cowboy breakfast tomorrow morning. What can people expect, Adam? Well, it's going to be actually very seasonable weather, so jacket weather and a bit of a chill to start the day, especially if you're out early before sunrise at the Cowboy Breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> ah, good memories when I mentioned Cowboy Breakfast. All right, let's take a look. Right now we're at 66, but we're, we'll quickly see those temperatures drop down through the 50s. I mean, by 8 p.m., 57, 10 p.m., 52, and then down through the 40s. I think we'll start the day tomorrow right near 40 degrees. So yeah, jacket weather at the bus stop or at the Cowboy Breakfast. We'll be back to talk about the weekend, which includes our next chance of rain coming up. In the buzz today, an Italian restaurant in Australia made a massive pizza to help raise dough for firefighters battling those devastating wildfires there. The owners of Pellegrini's Italian in Sydney wanted to do something big to help those fighting the fires. This rectangular pizza, 16 inches wide, but 338 feet long. That's longer than a football field. You know, you look at it in there and you're like, oh, that's not that impressive. Then it just yeah. keeps going and going. They sliced it up into 4,000 slices to feed the crowd that showed up to donate money for the New South Wales Rural Fire Service. Money well spent. All right, a North Carolina animal shelter taking an unusual approach to getting one particular cat adopted. The Mitchell County Animal Rescue posted her picture with the label World's Worst Cat. The cat named Perdita is described as liking jump scares, lurking, and being queen of the house. All fairly standard traits for cats, I think. <laughs> However, she does not like kittens, dogs, or children, so she will need to be a solo cat. All right. It's all in marketing, really. To, get to, to carry her title, yeah. yes. Do you know how long peanuts live? The answer is apparently 104 years old. At least that's how old Mr. Peanut was. That's right, was. It seems that planters Mr. Peanut is dead. He perished in a new commercial showing him sacrificing himself to save Matt Walsh and Wesley Snipes following a car crash. Yeah, parent company Kraft Heinz has purchased ad time during the Super Bowl to hold a funeral for its century-old mascot. A lot of people on Twitter jokingly calling shenanigans on this marketing ploy. Is it just monocle mayhem? We'll find out. <laughs> is he gone for good? Yeah. That's my question. Know. All right. Today, January 23rd, is National Pie Day. If you've been good so far on your New Year's diet resolutions, this could be your cheat day. Here's some ways to celebrate. You could host a pie party. Okay. You could listen to the 80s hair band Warrant song, Cherry Pie. Okay. You could post your pie creations or check out the creations of other pie lovers at the hashtag National Pie Day. And of course, some businesses are offering free and discounted slices of pie on National Pie Day. All right, what's your favorite pie? Uh, cherry, number one. Yes. I'm going to go with pecan, number two. I kind of agree with both of those. Oh, nice. Adam? It's a rare moment. I actually really like a good blueberry pie. Blueberry yeah. pie. Yeah. How about okay. rhubarb? You ever actually, had rhubarb I, that pie? is good, the yes. Rhubarb pie, uh -huh. yeah, it can be good. Oh, yeah. 
All right. I'm glad you no, went I along. Don't. I thought you were going to say, I don't like pie, especially not like National it. Pie Day. I don't like the day. Well, we that, like that's that. my Caskey impersonation. Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> close. Very yeah. close. Yeah. Oh, all right, so let's take a look first at uh, how hot it got outside today. Hot, you know, relative to what we had yesterday compared to the, what, what did we have yesterday for a high temperature? We had 59 degrees. Today we made it up to 73 for the afternoon high. Yes, a good, nice day. 78 down in Catula, so pushing 80 degrees down I-35. Even Laredo made it to 77, so noticeably warmer than the gray, rainy day we had yesterday. Right now we're at 66, dew point of 40. And a northerly wind at eight. It's that north wind which really helped to dry our air out. So we have got fairly lo low humidity out there. You know, Catula and Laredo still in the lower 70s. Nearby Creasel Springs at 64, but 50s in the hill country. Temperatures are definitely falling off very efficiently this evening because of the clear skies, the gentle breeze, and the dry air that's in place. So the good radiational cooling that we, you always hear us talking about. Ideal radiational cooling tonight. Dew points right around 40 degrees, so still the very dry air that's in place makes it comfortable and crisp outside. And overall, I think near average through the night. Clear sky right now. The clouds really aren't over Texas. They're all off to the east along with all the rain and even the snow showers that are in the midsection of the country, parts of the Great Lakes and the heavy the heavy rainfall moving through Tennessee. This is the same system that brought us our rainfall yesterday. A lot of upper level support with this, and that's why it's so far and wide reaching. We were just on the tail end of it, so we just got clipped by two thirds of an inch here, but better than nothing, and it definitely boosted the aquifer. We're almost four feet above the January average. Now tomorrow, Friday is going to be dry, but notice as we get into Saturday, we boosted those rain chances a bit now up to 40%. So just some scattered activity or widely separated. I think that's a good way to put it, especially along and east of I-35. So let's go through time. Clear and sunny again tomorrow. Friday, just enjoy the sunshine and comfortable conditions. But during the day tomorrow, we'll have a little ripple in the upper level flow develop over the Baja Peninsula. That little ripple in the flow, that's our disturbance for Saturday. That's going to head our way and, of course, increase our cloud cover, push some energy our way. Notice Saturday, 10 a.m., we'll have the clouds. Then as we get into the late afternoon and evening, I think we'll introduce the chance of a few showers. Some very light rain for the most part, and it should be just quickly passing brief showers, but a little dampness here and there. If you're outdoors Saturday evening and Saturday night, just be prepared to duck under an umbrella very briefly because we'll have those passing light showers tomorrow, starting the day at 40, making it to 68 for the high temperature. And then we get into Saturday and despite those clouds still very comfortable at 64 degrees and then the showers should last a little bit into early Sunday, but otherwise Sunday is looking like a day where we will clear out nicely, have a lot of sunshine and enjoy comfortable temperatures right near 70 degrees. Pie day, whatever. <laughs> there, that's more like it. That's, yeah, that's, that's it. Or what I expect. OK, I came across this again yesterday. This is an issue I have. It's one of those Little known facts about making homemade thermometers that uh, I have to really think through and not forget about or can affect the actual operation of the thermometer. So uh, let's take a look at this. You know, you know, I bowl, blow the glass, get that bulb on the end of the glass and here it is. There we go. All right. Get the bulb on the end of the glass and then I flip it around and I, I put the the flame over the entire length of the tubing. And the reason I do this is because every once in a while, I get a little bit of moisture in there from my breath mm. stuck in the tubing. It will basically condense in there after I blow that bulb. So I get that little bit of moisture and I don't want that to mix with my alcohol. Okay. In turn, I do what I call evacuate the tubing before I fill the alcohol. So I go, right down the line and look how it pu pushes and for forces that uh, ah, interesting. Yeah, that little bit of moisture out of there and then poof, that tubing is clean and perfect for and primed really for the alcohol to be placed in it. So oh. 
That's one thing that actually took me a few years to really figure out after I had a few issues with thermometers. <laughs> ah, yeah. we but, just thought you liked playing with an open yeah. flame. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so you just, need, you just need a Bunsen burner to get rid of the casky breath. <laughs> That's all it takes, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, Natalie Shipman, you're the winner of the homemade thermometer. I dropped you an email, and you can go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. All right, thanks, Adam. The ins and outs, right? Yeah. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next. Good morning to you. It is Thursday. It is January 23rd. We interrupt regular programming. A breaking news alert this afternoon after an indictment was handed down for former Precinct 2 Constable Michelle Marianthus Vela. Today she walked into a courtroom to face an indictment against her but was then let out in handcuffs and shackles. Stephen Ursula, Marianthus Vela learned about this indictment around midday and then made the decision to turn herself in in the basement of the Bear County Courthouse. She was then let out in handcuffs alongside her former captain Mark Garcia and then brought up to the first floor to see a judge to be officially magistrated. I'm going forward. I'm going forward to Bear County Sheriff's race. I've invested my own personal money with my, my husband alongside me. We are not, we're sending a strong message out there that we are not accepting high contributions. It's a bit bizarre, someone trying to break into the courthouse downtown. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says this happened just around 1230 this morning when a man in his 40s snuck into the main downtown county courthouse by housekeeping. Now, whether housekeeping let him in or if he posed as housekeeping, that is not clear at this time. Then tonight at midnight is when the call the cooks come in and they'll start cooking and then we'll start serving at 4.30 in the morning, 4.30 a.m. Now, if you don't know what time to get there, now you do. About 30,000 people expected to show up with appetites and the food will go fast. Of course, GMSA will be out there as well for live coverage all morning. I have to admit, cowboy breakfast snuck up on me.